Hey folks, Steve here coming at you from the kitchen table of evil because the garage of evil is just way too cold to work in right now um, as it's probably around 15 degrees here in New England. Um, we're going to pick up where we left off on the pickaxe how-to. Uh, my breadboard's still here. You can see that I've got this uh, regulated power supply built. You don't have that yet, but you don't need it and you don't need it because your batteries will work just fine and we're going to show you how to build that eventually. So you will see that I still have my LED plunked in here. Um, and of course I've got that the positive leg of the LED connected to the B.4 pin and the negative leg goes to a proper resistor which heads to the ground rail. Um, that resistor is a 100 ohm resistor and the reason why I know that's a 100 ohm resistor or that I should use a 100 ohm resistor is I went to my LED calculator here, plunked in my source voltage in this case it happens to be about 4.5 volts out of the B.4 pin I know that because I measured it with a multimeter um, I also know that my red LED takes 1.9 volts forward voltage and because it's a cheap Radio Shack LED requires about 30 milliamps forward current. I've already done it once but I'll click it again just so you get the idea and you can see that it spits out a 100 ohm resistor. Um, a quick note about resistors um, of course they have these color bands right? Now typically with these carbon film resistors that we're using the last color band is going to be either metallic gold or silver and that color band denotes the tolerance or how close to 100 ohms that thing actually is. In this case gold means 5%. So uh, what we can typically do if we don't know the value of the resistor that we're holding is we can actually take a look at the color bands and each of these color bands has a corresponding number. In this case brown happens to mean 1, black means 0, and then the third band is a multiplier. Um, that means 10 in this case. So I look at 0 and 1, that's 10. 10 times 10 is 100. That's 100 ohm resistor. And you can go online and you can actually pull down these uh, online resistor color calculators. And you can just visually plunk in the colors and they'll tell you what you have. Um, but just one more little info tidbit for you. Now you're going to see that my LED is kind of going on and off on its own accord. And there's a good reason for that. And we're going to go in the, into that in a second because what we're going to try to teach here is conditional programming meaning if something happens then do this um, but the first thing we need to cover is the fact that uh, we've declared through code and uh, I'm gonna actually do that right here in front of you just a real quick code um, that I want pin C.1 and we went to our pinout pin C.1 is this guy over here he's going off again and I'll show you why in a second we want that to be an input I've already run this program into this and that's why you're seeing it react that way yours isn't going to do that yet but I wanted to illustrate something that's very important and that is the idea of a pull up or a pull down resistor and how pins can float which gives us undesirable results so I'm going to plunk in the rest of this code now I've created a label because I want to make a loop here I've called it main which is typical I can call it anything it's the colon after the label that makes it something um, I'm going to ask the pickaxe to give me a serial terminal that actually shows me what's happening with that pin and I'm going to do that by typing this so SERTXD and then I need to create parentheses and first I'm going to tell it to actually type this in the screen value is spaces count, spaces a character and then I'm going to tell it to out, give me the output of that pin it's an input pin so I'm typing in pin C.1 not just C.1 and I'm telling it to do a carriage return and a line feed and uh, in case you wonder where carriage return and line feed are remember the old school typewriters? Well. These are ASCII 2 control codes, and that's kind of where all that comes from. So I'm telling it, give me the output of C.1 in decimal fashion, that's what that number sign means. Decimal fashion, of course, is the numbers that we all know and love. And then I'm saying, do a character return and a line feed after each time you do that. And what this is going to result in is that C.1 in this loop, and I'm going to create a loop right now by saying go back to main. Um, well, actually, you know what? I'll just let you see it. Easier, easier to see than it is to explain. So I've got that done. I'm going to hit my syntax checker just to make sure I did it right. I did. Knowing that, I'm going to hit program. And then we're going to wait for a second. And then we're going to keep waiting. And then we'll wait some more. Maybe I'll try to mix in some on hold music when I finally compile this. All right, so here we go. Download was successful. We click OK. OK, but we're not seeing anything. Now we can either hit F8 as a shortcut key to pull up the, the terminal window or I can go up here and just click terminal 
and look at that. Okay, value is zero. So we expected the value to be zero. That should be sort of the normal state of that pin. Um, but here's something funny. Now I'm actually just going to take my finger and move it over the breadboard, and you can see that that zero is just floating up into a one. Um, and that's because the capacitance of just my finger being there, there is causing enough interference for that pin to float high or float to a one. So we need to pull that pin down, and that's what a pull-down resistor does. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a 10K resistor. 10K is typically the value we use for pull-down or pull-up resistors. And I'm going to put this on my ground rail and then connect it over to that pin. And I've now just used that as a pull-down resistor. And now when I take a look at my value, put my finger anywhere, and we've got a nice, steady, consistent zero. So that's important. We've created a pull down resistor, it's pulling it down to ground. Now, if for whatever reason in my programming, I wanted the, the beginning state of that to be a, a high, um, then I would pull it up. And I would do that really simply. I would actually just go from positive rail over to that pin. And as you can see, the value is now one. We've now just created a pull up. But that's not what I want in this case. And in most cases, that's not what you're going to want either. Um, Again, we're keeping things really simple with this stuff. There's all sorts of caveats and exceptions to the rule. Um, but generally speaking, we want, you know, zero's off, one is on, and that's very easy to understand. And we've just accomplished that right now. So we should probably move into the next little bit, and that's going to be a bit of a conditional program. So I'm going to close this window. Um, I'm going to delete what I have here. And I'm going to make a program that says if the switch is pushed, uh, Blink the LED four times. Um, but I'm going to introduce you to a couple other things here. Some of the stuff we've touched upon already. First, I'm going to create a variable. Um, and I want to make that variable meaning, meaningful to me. It's name meaningful to me. So I'm going to rename that variable blink LED. And by doing what I just did, I'm saying to the pickaxe, anytime you see the words blink LED, I actually mean variable B.0 excuse me, B0, not dot, B0. Um, B0 is my first available byte size slot store variable. And, and a variable, again, is a number that varies. Um, unless we tell it otherwise, it will start at zero and then become whatever it is, um, whatever number that becomes based on how we manipulate it through code. But I've just created a storage slot in B0 for a variable that I'm going to meaningfully call blink LED. Now that I've done that, I'm going to create the beginning of my program again and using the same label and I'm going to say if pin c.1 which is where we're going to put our switch eventually equals zero then main and what that statement effectively says is if pin c.1 equals zero then main it means meaning it, it, unless that pin changes just keep looping and do nothing it's going to keep looping and checking that pin now if that condition is false it's going to continue reading down the program because it won't have no instructions to go to main. So here's another little programming trip that, trick that you're going to use all the time. Um, it's a very common command. You'll use it a lot. It's called the for next loop. And what this enables us to do, I'm just going to do it right here, for blink LED equals 1 to 4. So I'm, again, this, this cycle is going to vary. So I needed to use a variable. I called my variable blink LED, it's stored in B0. And what I'm saying is that every time we go through this for next loop, increment blink LED 1 through 4 each time it goes through. So then, okay, so now let's see. And then I'm going to nest within this loop um, my commands. So I'm going to say turn the LED on high, uh, pause for 200 or 200 per second, whatever it is, um, turn it off. Pause the same amount of time, so we have a steady blink. And then to end the for next loop, I use the command next. And what this does effectively is it says, if pin C.1 doesn't equal zero, then it's not going to go back to main. It's going to start reading again. And it's going to come here, and it's going to start incrementing this variable. The first time this variable goes through, it's going to be one. It's going to do this. Then this will become two. It's going to go again, three, again, four. And when it, once it hits the end of this, it's going to continue on to the next line of code after next. 
In this case, I'm just going to send it back up to main. And every time we hit the switch, this thing should blink four times, and then we're ready to go again. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to program this, and then wait for our on hold music. Now while that's programming, um, I have the switch here. So let me wait till that's finished programming. Just take just one more second. All right, so that's done. All right, here is the switch we're going to use. Um, this is um, <clears throat> just a really cheap micro switch. Um, actually comes out of the inside of an arcade cabinet button assembly. Um, I used to build an arcade cabinet, so I have a, a ton of these things lying around. It can be wired either normally open or normally closed. This is normally open, meaning that the circuit is just that. It's normally open when I press the button. It closes the circuit, so on. Um, it is a momentary switch, meaning it only works while the button's pressed down. So, of course, how do we wire this thing? Well, that's pretty simple, actually. We're going to put one leg right here on the C.1 pin. I'm going to put the other leg on positive, like so. Hopefully you can see all that. I think you can. Uh, is that working? Yeah, that's a bit in the way, but whatever. Um, and here we are. So that's the completed circuit. And then we hit the button. And look at that. Hit the button. Look at that. And that's that. Pretty simple. We've just created a conditional code that says if you see this input go high, in this case we're using a switch to do that, Blink the LED four times, then wait and try it again. And uh, that's all for this one.